President Tsai, Chairman Tsai, Professor Liao from Academia Sinica. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Tsai and President Liao. I'm very honored to be the moderator today to introduce the speaker to you. It's my honor to introduce President James Liao from Academia Sinica. And he graduated from Department of Chemistry in NTU, and he pursued further study in Wisconsin Madison, United States. He was elected the best inventor and also member of the um, Academia Sinica in the United States, and also he's of course a member, an honorable member of Academia Sinica, and he became um, the president of Academia Sinica in the past decade, and he's been succeeding the position for uh, twice. And he is focused on microbiology and also chemistry. And the CCSU technology he invented has been applied in aeronautics in for the application of biomass, and also in how to replace fossil fuel with biomass and bioorganization. He has advanced technology and has been recognized as a pioneer in the synthesized metabolites of modern technology. I remember once I was Googling Google Scholar and Jim C. Liao, I was wondering who he was. And then um, as I checked, I found out that until 1997 in UCLA, as he was a professor in Department of Chemistry and Bioengineering, and he had impact number in 98, and he has more than 30,000 times of citations. President Liao, he has received multiple international awards from the um, environmental, from the EPA, United States, and also he's been recognized by, by U.S. president and also in Italy, and also the um, Applied Engineering Science in the United States and also um, in Israel, in many other countries. Today, the topic for President Liao is our progress toward net zero 2.0 and acceleration of this progress. It's about uh, paralysis of hydrogen, meaning that um, the green, how to obtain green hydrogen through the latest pyrolysis technology, methane pyrolysis. So I think this is really a key technology for our future progress in Taiwan. And actually the Ministry of, Sci uh, of Science and Technology in Taiwan, we just passed a new act to form a commission of net zero technology in Taiwan. And the chairperson um, is actually um, Mr. Wu Zhengzong, um, the National Science Commission. And President Liao is a co-organizer for the commission. So today, I believe this is a beacon not only for our future technology development, but also a guideline for all industries related in this aspect. So now let's welcome President Liao, James Liao from Academia Sinica. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Chairman Tsai, Professor Zhou, President Lin, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, online and offline, good morning. Today I'm very honored to be able to share with you the technologies in Net Zero 2.0. And actually, Academia Sinica, just two weeks ago, we public publicly announced a white paper, a recommendation of net zero to point zero. I will not be reading through the white paper, but I will summarize and highlight some key points. First of all, I would like to emphasize among existing technologies, there is no tool and there is no way that we can deliver net 
carbon net zero、um, goal in 2050, let alone 2030. For all human beings, we must work fast and also actively develop new technologies so that we can deliver our net zero goal by 2050. And even though we are diligent, we work very hard to develop new technologies. It's not guaranteed that we can achieve the goal by 2050. So today, I think the topic is among all the technological options, how can we choose? How can we determine the future directions for development? Especially in my presentation. I will focus on human-centered, just transition. Even though we are talking about technology, but technology always started from human, and actually they are interconnected. Technology always stays in the context of society and human beings. So, we might elaborate the relationship between people and technology. So, as we discuss. Net zero. We need to have some parameters to measure. In 2019, in Taiwan, we have emitted 287 million、um, tons equivalent of carbon dioxide. So that is,、um, we have to stand up from where we fell. So we look into the categories where we emitted the most. For example, we use a lot of fossil energy. So how much energy we consumed? What were the key categories? Of course, it's mainly electricity, almost half of it. And so far,、um, in average, we use.、Um, Two hundred eighty billion kilowatts of electricity a year, and in total, how much energy we consume? If you translate that into oil equivalent, that is almost um, um, eighty-five million um of fossil fuel equivalent. So, if we translate that into electricity. That is almost four hundred eighty-eight point eight billion of kilowatt per hour. Suppose we have fifty-five percent of electricity efficiency. So that is how we translate the kiloliter、um, fossil fuel usage equivalent. So of course, look at the volume. Volume is very important. Actually, starting in senior high school,、um, we hear about these physical principles that all energies exist and the quantity they do not disappear for no reason. So, in 2019, we have emitted 287 million tons of carbon dioxide, which includes. Seventy-eight million tons of carbon dioxide of carbon. So, if we want to capture this carbon and transform them into other forms, so what might be the options? Okay, it could be concrete. That's about almost twelve million tons of production, and also there's a very low level of carbon in concrete. So, it's not a feasible option, not an ideal one. So, if you look at chemical production or chemical products, there will be ethylene. In 2020, we produced about four million tons of ethylene. Okay, still that's too little if compared to carbon emission. And if you look at wood, wood production, usually the unit would be.、Um, Cubic meters, 
But if you look at the weight, it's about、um, slightly less than four million tons. And most of the words we use in Taiwan are imported. So how about food? We consume a lot of rice. That's about one point two seven million tons. So all this, all these options, whether concrete, asphalt, etc.,、um, they are much less than the volume of carbon we emitted. So if we、um, emit、um, emit carbon capture and transform, actually, is still not enough. That means we have to start with net zero energy. So if we look at the portfolio. And in this pile chart, you can see what are the key categories and key industries that emit the most carbon. You can see the different hues of green that represent the proportion of carbon they use. So the biggest chunk will be electricity, which takes about fifty percent. And then we have transportation, that's about twelve point six percent. Why we have a lot of carbon. In transportation, it's because we burn the fossil fuel. We use fossil fuel, and then we will have combustion, etc. And we have different vehicles from motorcycle, sedan, trucks, vessels, aircraft. All those twelve point six percent. And among it, um, sedan and motorcycle. Well, actually, it's less than six percent. Not much. And also, we have construction industries. They use. For example, coal or fossil. These fossil fuels are burned, and they did not directly use electricity. Also,、um, that means they take three point seven percent that、um, solid fuel. And also, we have petrochemicals. That's about three point one percent. So overall. By burning these、um, fossil fuels, that takes about ninety percent of the overall carbon emission. The agricultural activities also lead to carbon emission. The agriculture only accounted for one point one percent, and、uh, waste disposals also lead to carbon emissions. For other industries. Uh, it kind of for three point three percent. So, energy usage is the major、uh, carbon emitter. So, how should industries reduce their carbon emission? There are several efforts they can take. First of all, they need to increase the energy efficiency. Many industries have continues on these efforts. It is not enough to just increase energy efficiency. As we mentioned before,、uh, many carbon emissions is caused by direct carbon.、Uh, Burning、um, fossil fuels. Not all processes can be electrified. Electrifications.、Uh, electrification is not、um, applicable to all industries, but we hope that we can make it as much as possible. And also, when these industries are electrified. Power generation process can be centralized and managed centrally. For industries, including、um, productions, manufacturing, and constructions, there are some efforts that they can take to reduce their carbon emissions. They may also choose,、uh, for example,、um, hydrogen powers for steel making. We are doing a lot in transportation sector. Many 
buses are electrified now. Many scooters and sedans are electrified as well. We are also moving into electric trucks. And a few days ago, Tesla have announced their new electric truck models. There are still uncertainties, but electrification is still an important trend. In our daily life, how can we reduce carbon emissions? We need to conserve energy, recycle, and take public transportation. These are all important, and we also need to see how we can contribute to carbon emission efforts. The residential usage. Accounted for six percent of power in Taiwan. Once again, transportation is accounted for twelve point six percent of power power consumption in Taiwan. Once again, we still need to generate a lot of carbon free. Electricity. So our suggestion to the government is that on the path and journeys toward net zero, it is important to develop carbon-free electricity. With carbon-free electricities, we can electrify many different sectors in the industries. For example. Um, we can achieve about forty-five point five percent of industries into electrifications. It's an influential effort that we can take in industries. We can also cover、um, commercial and service sector around ten percent, as many of these service sector industries already use electric electricity for most of their power consumption. Electrification can also apply to transportations and residential usage. Some people would suggest to use hydrogen power. Once again, hydrogen is a vehicle; it's not an energy itself. Hydrogen is produced with some kind of energy. If you are using hydrolysis to generate hydrogens, however, if your power source is carbon emitting, it's not really a green energy. So you still need to go back to the basics to produce carbon-free electricity. Once again, carbon is a vehicle, not a power source itself. Why we we are moving electric electrifications? We need to know how much electricity we need to use. Currently, we are using twenty eight, two hundred eighty billion kilowatt hours of power each year. And burning fossil fuels accounted for forty-two point four percent of carbon emission. In the future, if we can increase our electrifications、uh, proportions, we can reduce our carbon emission. For example, if you move fifty percent into electrifications, we will need more than four hundred billions kilowatt hours of power. If we want to reach ninety percent electrifications, we will need two hundred and twenty billion kilowatt hour. 
of additional power. So this is the rough numbers we can see here. And one of the important prerequisite is that our demands do not increase in the future. So once again, if we want to electrify most of our power consumption, we need four hundred to five hundred billion kilowatt hours of power in the future. So it creates a huge burden to the power generation system. Power generation is also related to air pollutions, and that's why we encourage people to think about new technologies when it comes to uh, carbon reductions and also electrifications. We hope that our efforts in carbon reductions can also solve other issues at the same time. Among all the energy options, how do we prioritize? If you took look at this graph, the x s y is the carbon reductions amount. And the x s x is the population number that are impacted. Some people are already marginalized or disadvantaged in the society, so we need to prioritize their needs and minimize their impact. The priority social issues often impact a lot of people, but they do not emit a lot of carbon. On the left hand side. Some of the technology sector may be able to reduce a large amount of carbon, but they do not impact a huge number of populations. So, if you can influence and change the technology on the left hand side, you can actually make a lot of contributions in carbon reductions without impacting a large population. Eventually, we want to reduce carbon emissions in all different aspects, but we can still prioritize some technologies to ensure carbon reduction first. When we modify or evolve these technologies, they will not impact a large number of populations initially. As we move toward to the right, you need to have more stakeholder discussions. You need to explain more to the public society. And later on in the afternoons, we will listen to a report from Director Joe and NTU, and they will talk about how people in the general public perceive a net zero target and carbon reduction efforts. Moreover, new technologies and emerging technologies can also power industry transformations. Therefore, our suggestions would be starting from technology developments to facilitate industry transformation. This is the logic of all our policy suggestions. We need to find priorities, and we also need to start with the high carbon emitting industries. We should definitely start with those 
high carbon emitting industries that impact fewer numbers of populations. There are all kinds of technology options. How do we prioritize them? Once again, we want to prioritize those feasible and、um, impactful technologies. For example, Department of Energies in the United States announced yesterday that they have. A new breakthroughs in nuclear infusion. Because their output is much higher than their inputs, it's the, it's an important technology breakthroughs, but it is not possible for us to evaluate its feasibilities at the moment. If it can be successful, it can reduce significant numbers of carbon. Besides the car,、uh, nuclear infusion technologies, what we can do in Taiwan at the moment is what we can prioritize. First of all, we need to have high-efficiency solar. We also need to do paralysis. We also need to utilize geothermal as well as、um, ocean energy. We have been talking about geothermal and ocean energy for 20 years with minimal progress. However, with technology developments, we believe that these two will be important and more likely to succeed in the near future. As I said before, that we emit two hundred eighty-seven million tons of carbon dioxide in two thousand nineteen in Taiwan. Maybe we can generate all kinds of different chemicals in Taiwan. If we want to generate these chemicals, for example, we can use 12.6 million tons of carbon dioxide, that accounted for 5% of our carbon emission in Taiwan. But in the process, you will need 114 billion degree, uh, 114 billion kilowatt hours of power. So, if we want to use five percent of our carbon emissions, we need to use a large number of power in the process. So, once again, it's a reminder that we need to start with carbon-free energy, because if you are only trying to use the carbon that you have emitted, we will ne never be able to catch up. With the carbon emission effort that we have done already, once again, all the things that I have mentioned before is a reminder that we want to use green energy and carbon-free power. So, where does it come from? Where can we get get those green energy? Of course, we can produce ourselves, or we can import. We can produce with solar and wind. We we can also explore ocean energy and geothermal. These are important, and that's something we can produce ourselves. We have very limited options in Taiwan, but geothermal and ocean energy is something we can achieve. It is challenging, but I think we cannot give up on these two options. 
We can also produce energy with biomass. Um, biomass can contribute, but it's limited as well. As to imported energy, the first possibility is that we use LNG. We have um, gas, and then we capture. We have carbon capture technology, and theoretically. Um, because we capture all the carbon emitted and then we consolidate and capture them. Like I said, theoretically, it's feasible. However, it, there's a big question mark if we are using a lot of carbon and we need to capture a lot. Secondly, if we use hydrogen, so actually hydrogen can be extracted from um, gas, natural gas, and steam reforming. Actually, that is the most methane. Methane steam reforming. Actually, that is the most efficient way of extracting hydrogen for power. However, at the same time, as we are producing hydrogen, we are also emitting carbon dioxide. So that means we need to capture and consolidate the carbon. So again, that will be. A huge consumption also cost for energy and quality. Next, if we use natural gas and we use methane pyrolysis technology, quite how is it different from the previous option? That is, in this option, we are transforming hydrogen into solid state instead of steaming state because when they are in steaming state. It's more difficult to capture, especially before combustion. And if we have solid carbon and solid state of hydrogen, it's much easier to capture and store. And actually, they are very good for industrial production. They can be、uh, a sort of raw materials, also spare energy. For example, they can be burned, like car,、uh, like coal. So I mean, if one day we want out of other resources. And of course, by then,、um, carbon emission will not be the first,、uh, the priority as concern. So this methane pyrolysis, this is a, a a technology that has been developed around the world for more than a decade ago. And at that time, we were transforming natural gas into pure hydrogen or pure carbon, so that、um, when we have These pure elements they can be used in advanced or premium industrial、um, application. However, here we are for electricity, and since it's for electricity, then we wouldn't need pure form of hydrogen or pure form of carbon. That means the cost for the technology can be driven down for several levels. So, for example, pure form of hydrogen, which acts for five nights after the point. I mean, the cost is exponentially different. And actually, for power production, we need maybe、um, about fifty percent of purity when it comes to solid state of carbon. So, in order to prevent stereotypes or biases. In the cost of capturing these elements, actually, we would prefer to use another term, a new term, to explain our idea. That is methane pyrolysis, meaning that we remove carbon and then we burn the hydrogen. That is methane pyrolysis, and we don't have to store hydrolysis in this process because we are using it right away. And next option here on the slide is importing green hydrogen.、Um, this is a new technology being developed in Japan and Australia. Theoretically, we can make use of. We can actually rely on the vast production in Australia because they are building solar panels in the vast area of land, and also they have special technology to ship. The hydrogen to Taiwan, however, it will be rather costly, and the technology is still under development. But there's a possibility. Maybe take some more time. 
In addition, hydrogen can be a vehicle for energy. Same for ammonia, and actually, we have much mature technology in for ammonia. Certainly, we still emit carbon during the process of producing ammonia, and at the same time, there is still also the possibility of building up a factory or. Ammonia production site in Australia, and the cost will be slightly less than hydrogen. Next option on the side is to import biomass raw material. It's feasible, but the quantity is limited. If we need a big scale, then maybe it's not feasible through this option. Last but not least, it would be to import nuclear fossil fuel. That is, we leverage nuclear energy, but、um, nuclear waste that would be very costly when it comes to social communication. And in Taiwan, as we all know, we've been discussing this matter for a long while, and it looks like at current state we are still discussion, and we are not reaching a conclusion in the near future. And like I said yesterday, in the Department of Energy in the United States, they just announced a new technology of nuclear fusion. And that is actually shedding new light for the hope of nuclear technology around the world. Of course, it's a exciting news. It could be a new milestone, but when and how are we going to use it or benefit from this technology? We have no answer yet. So, based on all these different options, some of them are possible, and we have four categories here. Four category of priority. Number one is we need to promote as soon as possible, and second we need to expand the promotion. Accelerate as soon as possible, meaning that、um, we've been discussing and we are not dedicated yet. But in this category, these methods, once they succeed, I mean, even if they have high risk, but they have high impact. So in this category, you can see、um, high efficiency solar panels,、uh, solar power, and also methane paralysis,、uh, thermal power, marine power, etc. And the second category is that、um, we need to expand the promotion, expand the campaign. For example,、um, wind power,、um, emerging biomass power, and also、uh, network building,、um, electricity or energy capture. Social and other economic methods. In this category, these options have received some resources, or the government has dedicated efforts in this. But we can do better. And number three, the third category is that we need to continue the promotion. For example, these are the traditional biomass energy, hydropower, traditional、um, CCUS technology, etc. And the fourth category would be that we need to follow up really closely. For example, the future nuclear technology, the future,、um, like I said,、um, the、um, energy department in the United States they just announced the、um, new nuclear fusion technology and also the latest CCUS technology. That is, these might be emerging technology, but、um, it deserves our attention. So that we can have the best timing to dedicate our、um, resources at the best time. So now I would like to share with you、um, high efficiency solar power. Its significance, well, I think it's no need to explain.、Um, the challenge here is that in Taiwan we have limited area for solar panels because we are a mountainous island. We have populous urban communities. So if we look at the electricity efficiency, it's about twenty. Percent or so, and we can have 28 gigawatts per device, and it's not enough. So, how can we improve the efficiency and also the volume of solar power? Number one, okay, we need to expand the area from 40 percent to 60 percent or 80 percent. It could, it's feasible theoretically, but that would come with a high social cost. Secondly, we can improve. The electricity efficiency, 
if we can improve from 20% to 30% of power production efficiency, then that would be, for example, when we reach the threshold of 50%, that means we exchange land with technology. Since we have limited land, then we can use high-level technology, for example, really efficient solar panels. High-efficiency solar panels, yes, they are under R&D, under production in the lab. But to reach commercial production, there are still some bottlenecks to break through. So far, the solar panels we're using, they are single digit, they are single chip. There is a ceiling, about 33%, that's a conversion rate. And actually, in reality, if we can reach 27 to 28% of a conversion rate, that is good enough. And actually, what is available in the market, there are mostly 22% of conversion rate. So we can change um, the form of solar panels. For example, we can use new materials. And for example, the new elements. For example, we can stacked panel, and the new element For example, perovskite, that is an element to produce um, better high or higher efficiency solar panels, even though they are not under development in the lab. But um, for commercial production, it takes some time. So we are seeing some new light for the next generation solar power, but um, it takes some time. And as we have discussed with local producers, providers, if um, once the R&D is completed that we um, have confirmed the technology, we do have the production chain, the supply chain. We have the capacity to develop the real devices for use. So we are still discussing with um, suppliers. So what are the challenges? Well, in the lab, um, it's easy to reach um, high efficiency, but it's pricey. So it's difficult to low to lower or drive down the cost. What we need in the market is they should be cost efficient and they should be able to last because for uh, solar panels, ideally we need needed to be in function for 20 years. So for example, um, for packaging, uh, commercial production, these are challenges. But of course, in challenges, we have opportunities. From the perspective of R&D, this is a new pathway, a new path. If we succeed in this aspect, of course, that means a new technology to be developed. So this is the stacking solar panel that we have mentioned before. You can use two different kinds of materials. You can use perovskite, or you can use silicones as well. Therefore, you can um, receive energy from all spectrums and transform them into power. In that case, you can have higher conversion rate. But once again, you need to overcome some productions and cost issues. If I can't generate one kilowatt of green energy, how can we maximize efficiency? If you replace a one kilowatt hour um, traditional power, with um, green power, you can save around 0 0.9 kilogram of carbon dioxide. If we c so, that's the higher efficiency situation. So, it's better if we can use it directly. However, if we have excess green power. We need storage facility. If we can store it and release them when we need it, we can still 
save around 0.8 kilogram of carbon dioxide. The battery efficiency is about 90 percent, and in that case, that one kilowatt hour of green energy can be transformed into 0 0.9 kilowatt hour of green energy. There is an issue for battery. Is that you can, it cannot save or store the energy for too long. For example, if you save, if you charge your uh, smartphone, and you can leave it there for a week or two weeks, and then you can see that the battery will discharge eventually. If you want to have long-term storage. You can also use one kilowatt hour of green energy to conduct hydrolysis and generate hydrogen. If you use this process, you will only have 0 0.48 kilowatt hour of energy after this process. In that case, you can save around 0 0.42 kilogram of carbon dioxide. The benefit is that you can store these energy for long term. So these are several ways that we can use one kilowatt hour of green energy, and there are different efficiency numbers you can see here. This is the long term prospects. That we can think about in the future. So here, no matter you are using battery or you are using hydrogen, you are trying to save the green energy as much as possible over time. If we can have more advanced developments in battery efficiency, and in the future maybe our battery sets can store the energy for six months or one year without um, efficiency loss, then it can be a very competitive option. And of course, that if you generate hydrogen. You can use it in other industries such as、um, petrochemical industries. We can also break down natural gases in order to generate、um, hydrogen as well. So you can have a solid carbon for storage, and you can also. Generate、um, hydrogens for other usage. In this process, you can use one kilowatt of、um, green energies and generate six point three point six kilowatt hour of energy or two point six kilowatt hour of energy、uh, in this process. If we break down natural gases and the、uh, solid carbon. Can be stored or can be used as industrial material. In July this year, European unions already start a new process. Then they can accept natural gas or nuclear as green energy with conditions. So there are certain conditions. If they can meet those conditions. Then European unions are willing to accept natural gas or nuclear as green energy. But it's important that we need to increase efficiency for natural gas for and nuclear energy. Of course, that natural gas can be a very 
consistent um, energy source compared to solar or wind. If you use natural gas as green energy and use this process, it is completely compatible with the current natural gas power plants. So the current uh, natural gas power plants can start to reconfigure and then start to explore how they can break down natural gases and generate hydrogens in the future. But of course, there are some challenges if you want to use these technologies to break down natural gases. First of all, in Taiwan, we still need to import those natural gases. We are seeing different solutions around the world in Norway or United States. I think those are the technology we can also pay attention to. In the future, we may be able to find better solutions for natural gas um, storage. So what's the difference for pyrolysis and the traditional natural gas power plants? On the left hand side is the traditional methods. On the right hand side, you see the new natural gas um, hydrolysis. Um, I think I have one more minute, but I'll try to explain it as fast as possible. I hope I can get one more hour, but I don't think it's possible. Um, this is an important idea, but I don't think that many people have paid attention to it in the past. There are different ways that we can generate um, hydrogen. So these are different methods that we can compare. This is just a theory, but it's a very simple theory that you can understand very easily. On the left hand side, you see hydrolysis. You need to invest certain uh, energy in order to generate hydrogen. So, in the hydrogen um, hydrolysis process, you do not have net gain in your energy productions. The benefit is that you can produce hydrogens and you can store the energy in the long term. At the center, this is the this is the energy uh, production process that I have introduced to you today. That in the process you need to invest some energy, but you can have higher energy output. Therefore. You can have net gain in your energy output, and also you can generate a solid carbon. On the left, on the right hand side, you can also see some benefits in energy output. However, it will generate carbon dioxide. You still need to capture it afterwards. So these are different methods that we can generate hydrogens. Currently, it is still difficult that we need if we want to mix natural gas and hydrogens in the power generations. But I think that by 2025 to 2030, you can find solutions. So this is a basic calculations uh, of the benefits between traditional power generations and hydrogens power generations. Compared with traditional um, natural gas power plants, the new technologies can generate carbon, uh, solid carbons.
but and you can also generate more power in the process. So therefore, with the new technologies, you can have a net profits of more than twelve thousand NT dollars per unit. Therefore, the industries and and technology that we introduce today will have huge benefits regarding、uh, financially and also environmentally. So once again, pyrolysis is a solution that we can reduce carbon emission in Taiwan, and you can support very stable power source. You can also generate and produce solid carbon in the process to reduce the cost. This is a successful demonstrations in Academia Sinica. So in this whole demonstrations, you can generate solid carbons and you can have higher power generations. In the next few minutes, I'll talk about geothermal and ocean energy. Once again. Taiwan has a lot of geothermal resources that we haven't tapped into. In Japan, we they have more than six hundred and three megawatts, and the Philippines have utilized nearly two thousand megawatts of geothermal. So we have the potential, but our development is very limited at the moment. In Taiwan, we have a few active volcanoes, so we have to drill deep under the surface in order to explore the geothermal energy. As we have better、um, underground exploration technologies. It is better and easier for us to identify geothermal energy in the future. Once again, we also have a lot of marine power, and we also have very stable flow speed and flow rate compared with Japan and the Philippines. In the past, it was difficult because that is. Engineer is very. It's a very difficult engineering area on the eastern part of Taiwan. Our ocean bed is very deep, so therefore you need to、um, have a very、um, deep anchor on the ground. So in the future, we want to utilize the sections on the northeastern part of Taiwan. There are still some challenges. Besides the engineering efforts, we also need to have better exploration technologies. We are now working with some universities to establish pilot sites. Last but not the least, by 2050, we have to think about the potential power composition in Taiwan. We hope that the new technologies that I have introduced to you, the pyrolysis, will account for 27 percent of power generation in Taiwan, and we also need to rely on solar and wind for 40 percent. We also need to、um, rely on, for example, geothermal and marine energies. Last but not the least, we hope that the public society can support these carbon reduction efforts. First of all, we need to invest in technology developments and research. We also need to support reasonable and feasible carbon fees and energy prices. Thank you very much.